It's right there. Dysprosium. 16 years ago we made our first video about dysprosium. You can see we've got a very thin foil sample of, of dysprosium. It was rather a boring element then and it's really gone up in the popularity scale and it's now become really quite important technologically and also in fundamental science. In the original video Pete found a small sample of dysprosium sheet in a drawer in our store downstairs. This wonderful sample of dysprosium. So Neil and I went down to look for the sample that Pete had got. It was gone. Someone must have taken it for their experiment without admitting it because it's quite expensive metal. Fortunately, our friend Anthony Lippmann and his collaborators in the company G. Chapman have provided us with two really nice samples, in fact three, two pieces of metal and also a lump of so-called dendritic dysprosium metal where it has crystallized in a sort of fibrous form which looks really good and it was too nice to try and destroy chemically so I'm going to keep it to display. We're going to show you some really quite nice reactions of the metal but before that we're going to talk about its magnetic properties. Dysprosium is one of the so-called rare earth elements and it's in the periodic table above californium, the very radioactive element, but surprisingly it's attracted to magnets really quite strongly. Neil has a very powerful small magnet and with this magnet he managed to lift up the larger lamp of dysprosium right off the table. He also took some filings of dysprosium metal. You know we tend to use a file to form finely divided metal and he could move the filings round on the sheet of paper with his magnet underneath. I quite like that. But the exciting chemistry and magnetism we'll get to in a minute. Dysprosium metal dissolves quite easily in hydrochloric acid. And Neil and Brady had quite a lot of fun. Bubbles away release of hydrogen and the dysprosium chloride that's formed is completely soluble in water or weak acid. Fortunately, we didn't have to use that solution for our reactions because my colleague Peter Harvey lent us a whole bottle of dysprosium chloride which he was using for magnetic experiments. And so we had a nice solution of dysprosium chloride and we filled a whole series of test tubes to try different reactions. The first reaction was with carbonate solution and you get a nice precipitate of dysprosium carbonate. It's white. Most of the salts of the rare earths elements are colourless. We then tried the hydroxide and we got another precipitate that was white but it looked slightly different. It's what chemists call slightly gelatinous, more like a jelly. Sulfide. Then we tried the sulfide. That also produced a precipitate. And this is really quite exciting because normally when we try these tests 
There's one test after another when nothing exciting happens. And Brady says the professor doesn't know what he's doing. In all these tests, we put the dysprosium salt into a test tube containing whatever the reagent was, hydroxide, carbonate, and so on. We also did it with sodium chromate, which is quite strongly yellow, the solution. And when you add the dysprosium chloride, you get a precipitate of the dysprosium chromate. But because the solution is so colored anyway, you don't see it very well. So we reversed it, filled a test tube with dysprosium chloride and dropped in some chromate, and then you saw a beautiful yellow precipitate. Finally, not to disappoint Brady, we decided to do permanganate, which as you know is a very dark purple color this in solution, and we dropped some permanganate into the dysprosium chloride solution, and nothing happened. So Brady was pleased. Professor wrong again. Anything happen? You made us do that. <laughs> yeah. We then thought we would add acid to all of these test tubes. The dysprosium carbonate bubbled, releasing CO2 and dissolved. We added hydrochloric acid, so we were regenerating the dysprosium chloride. Similarly, the dysprosium hydroxide dissolved up. and the sulphide, though there was also a bit of a smell of rotten eggs, hydrogen sulphide, which is quite nostalgic to me. I used to use hydrogen sulphide at school. With the chromate, it was interesting because the solution changed color almost instantaneously because chromate can, in acid solution, can form dichromate. There's an equilibrium between dichromate and chromate. One is orange and the other is yellow. But then, just to snub Brady, when we put the hydrochloric acid into the permanganate, it went colorless. Oh, there you go not because of the dysprosium, but because hydrochloric acid reacts with permanganate to produce chlorine. But still, it was a nice color change. So we had a series of reactions which really look nice and demonstrate that dysprosium has really quite similar chemistry to the other rare earths. And this is part of the problem that the chemists in the 19th century had when they were trying to isolate this element. In fact, the name dysprosium comes from the Greek word. I think it's dysprositos, which means difficult to separate. Dysprosium was discovered by the French chemist Paul-Emile Lecoq, who also discovered gallium and samarium. He was really quite an interesting character. He wasn't a professional chemist. He didn't work at a university. He worked in the second bedroom of his two-bedroom apartment. Don't try separating elements in your bedrooms. The way he identified these elements was largely by looking at the spectra of the elements when they were heated in a flame. And he noticed some extra lines which he assigned to dysprosium. But then trying to actually isolate the dysprosium was really very hard. I suppose in those days there was a huge driving force to discover another element. So people kept on doing it until they found an element. Let's now look at the more modern chemistry. And 
the real interest in dysprosium, apart from using it in alloys to make better magnets for things like wind turbines, has been in what is called single molecule magnets. You probably know that the information on many computers on hard disks are stored magnetically and over the years the amount of space each bit that is stored requires has got smaller and smaller and it still requires quite a large collection of atoms to store one bit. However, there are a number of new compounds which are so-called single molecule magnets where just one magnetic atom in the middle of the molecule is enough to store this information. So you can align the magnetic moment of that atom and it will stay there and won't flip back because otherwise you'd lose the information. So one direction represents a one and one direction so represents zero? Zero. Right, okay. Well, people have not got as far as actually representing things, but they've got as far as making materials where the magnetic information will be preserved for a relatively long time. The first molecule that was made was by a chemist called Layfield at the University of Sussex in the south of England. The dysprosium atom was sandwiched between two C5 rings and they had some extra groups here as well so that each atom was nicely isolated. This molecule would retain its magnetism up to about the temperature of liquid nitrogen which is 77 Kelvin, the boiling point of liquid nitrogen. More recently a group in Manchester working with a group in Australia have made a new compound which has a dysprosium atom sandwiched between two nitrogen atoms and there's almost a straight line between the two nitrogens and the dysprosium and this keeps the dysprosium atom very well isolated so once its magnetic moment is aligned it doesn't lose it at all easily. This compound operates at a higher temperature. It still needs a low temperature but I believe it's above 100 degrees Kelvin. The rare earths are not terribly rare but at the moment much of the supply of dysprosium comes from China. Some of it comes from Myanmar and deposits have now been discovered in Australia. There are quite a few minerals that contain dysprosium but it's not pure, it's just one of several components and not the biggest metallic component of a particular ore. So what is really the key to making dysprosium is to separate it from a rather impure ore at a reasonable economic cost. And over the last 20 years or so, the price of dysprosium has rocketed up and down. I have no idea how much the sample that we were generously given is worth, but it is still quite a rare element to have in the lab. One of the things that our gallant technician Neil really loves is sprinkling fine powder of the elements into a Bunsen burner. Certainly dysprosium did not disappoint. We weren't sure what to expect, but it produced very bright sparks. One experiment completely bleached out the video camera's picture because the light was so bright. Mm -hmm. 
I thought it looked really beautiful. I think together with some of the other rare elements, fireworks, I'd really like to have a dysprosium firework as well. As you know, we like to observe what happens in our experiments. And at the end, just before Neil was clearing up his fume cupboard, he noticed that some of the tiny particles of dysprosium salt on the floor of the fume cupboard, probably the oxide from when he burnt the metal fragments or possibly the chloride, had absorbed water from the atmosphere. These are so-called hygroscopic compounds. They absorb water from the atmosphere and in principle, not with dysprosium but with other salts, you can actually get water from the atmosphere. And there are groups in California who are trying to make emergency water supplies for travelers, for soldiers in the field using compounds that will attract water from the air. They've even got water from the air in Death Valley. Thanks for showing your support by watching this video. If you'd like to support us further and appear here on our periodic table of patrons, why not check out the links below? You can see we haven't actually got a dysprosium supporter at the moment, but you can choose any element. Here are some of the people on there at the moment. And supporting us on Patreon means you'll also get access to extra goodies, extended footage, behind the scenes stuff. Check it out. And as I said, there are links down below. Also easy to obtain. It's a major component of air. It's quite cheap to make. Also, it has a convenient temperature of 77 degrees Kelvin, minus 196 degrees centigrade.